welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this local area. The National Farmers Organization takes pride in inventing a marketing system to meet the needs of the 20th century, collective bargaining for agriculture. NFO represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers. U.S. Farm Report presents Marketing Through the NFO. Today's host and moderator, Mr. Ed Chima of Marengo. This is Ed Chima reporting for U.S. Farm Report, the nation's most widely viewed farm TV program today. On today's U.S. Farm Report, we have two guests from, uh, first of all, Willis Rowell from Eastern Iowa, Edgewood. Willis is a member of the National Board of Directors of the National Farmers Organization and has a 400-acre general uh, farming uh, set up in Clayton County. Uh, also with us is uh, John Ingalls from Rockford, Iowa, in northern Iowa. And John is a past member of the National Board of Directors and now works closely with the uh, grain department of the National Farmers Organization. Today's on today's program, we'd like to go primarily into the uh, NFO's uh, various marketing programs and how you can sell through the NFO and the benefits of it. Uh, I think that uh, some of you people in the audience may wonder why the NFO, what's the reason for it, and so on. And I think to su summarize this real briefly is uh, I'd like to read you a uh, quote or two from the uh, United States House of Representatives House Committee on Agriculture report that was printed recently. And it's uh, it says that while the study published here is based on statistics and facts of 1966 and prior years, this forward must take note and, and of and give emphasis to the distressing, distressing developments in agriculture occurring in the first months of 1967. Some of these developments are from, the, uh, from August of 1966 to April of 1967, Agricultural prices suffered their sharpest decline since the late 1920s and early 1930s. Prices received by farmers in the marketplaces dropped to the lowest level in 33 years in relation to the rest of the economy. These prices declined 10% between August of 1966 and April of 1967. Although there was some recovery in May and June, the parity ratio dipped in April to 72% the lowest for any month since 1934. And I think that vividly illustrates uh, why the NFO. You cannot have a situation like this uh, continue in agriculture over a long period of time without seriously damaging agriculture, not only agriculture, but the economy of the nation as a whole. Uh, we, uh, the NFO some time ago had a large meeting at Des Moines, Iowa, a meeting for action. And at this meeting were several uh, things uh, that were decided upon, and I think there are three important points that were brought out at this meeting. Uh, those uh, three points was the adoption of a policy of no price, no production. The uh, second major point was that the NFO would build for an all-out holding action on all commodities, and uh, we'll go into more detail on this in a little bit. And then the third main point is that, that uh, at this meeting was adopted an NFO grain bank program. And uh, we'll go into some detail on these various programs in just a little bit. And at this point, I'd like to ask Willis Rowell what his impression of the uh, Des Moines meeting was. Well, of course, Ed, the statistics you quoted a few minutes ago uh, were the motivating force uh, when the Board of Directors decided to have this meeting for action. To me, it re represented a historic landmark in agriculture in the United States. Number one, the fact that there were 35,400 farmers from a 28-state area that were willing to travel to Des Moines, Iowa at their own expense to spend the day to help the board of directors uh, set up policy, future policy for the organization, a sense of direction for the organization. To me, this was historic in itself. Also, this uh, great number of people would certainly prove the wide acceptance of the NFO collective bargaining program. The determination that was showed by these people was certainly gratifying to me as a member of the board of directors. When they adopted the policy of no price, no production, to me it means just exactly that. This is exactly what these people propose. They have authorized the national board of directors to take whatever steps are necessary 
to prepare for an all-out holding action on all commodities, and they are determined enough in this effort to go as far as authorizing us and our membership to close down the in total agricultural plant in the United States if this is necessary to get a fair price. Going to John Ingalls, uh, why uh, would it be necessary to do this on all commodities at one time, John? Well, Ed, I think that without question that we must always remember in farm commodities that one commodity, the price on one commodity, hinges on another. And naturally, uh, because of this, you cannot bring the price up in one commodity without also bringing it up into another commodity. Otherwise, you will run into many problems in the commodity in which the price was raised. Uh, going on uh, then to uh, uh, the NFO Grain Bank, John, uh, what would uh, be involved here with just briefly? Well, the NFO Grain Bank was conceived, I believe, it germinated actually almost a year ago because of some of the things that we learned in our in-position sales program. The NFO Grain Bank is merely an operation by which the NFO members will sign up at least a very minimum of 50% of their total saleable grain into a grain bank which will not move out of that bank for less than a dollar and a half per bushel on corn and similar prices on soybeans and uh, wheat. Now, uh, going on a little farther, well, well let's, uh, uh, along with uh, these various programs uh, that the NFO has, is the fact that farmers need to sell together in order to make this work. Now, we, uh, we hear various proposals and so on, and why is it so necessary that we sell together? Well, of course, the very heart of collective bargaining is cooperation. It is pulling your pr production together as individual farmers, bargaining together, selling together, enhancing the price of your product, and putting yourself in a position where you can put your own price tag on your product as a group. I think uh, in explaining this a little farther, uh, let's, uh, using corn as an example, uh, let's say that uh, we put uh, corn in a grain bank and that uh, moment it rose to, uh, got to a dollar and a half a bushel, and let's say that uh, I as an individual sold my corn. Then, uh, just as an individual sold it, I'll, almost uh, immediately then, that uh, will say, well, if your corn is only worth $1.45. And so you sell yours the next day at $1.45 as an example, and uh, then the next day John's going to sell his, and lo and behold, the market's gone down to $1.40. And uh, so I think the key point on this is that we uh, not only hold it together, but we sell it together, and that we all sell together at one time at $1.50, and not me $1.50 one day and immediately drive the price down for you that we sell the next day. Now, uh, going on, uh, the uh, NFO has a marketing program uh, for all commodities, all major commodities, and I suppose we should probably accept uh, fiber products from this. Uh, we don't currently have a program for fiber products, which would be primarily cotton, but this can be developed at the point that the cotton uh, or fiber people would be interested in a program. Now, uh, as far as the uh, uh, selling through the NFO, the NFO is proposing and attempting to challenge or change the status quo in farm marketing and this certainly, as has been brought out, means selling together, uh, holding together and selling together, and not only selling together, but selling it through a contract. Now, uh, in order to uh, bring ourselves to the point where we'd be really effective, we had some various programs that we're using and have been real effective, and uh, we need further participation to uh, make them work even better. And we'll go into the details of this in a little bit. Now, first of all, it would be on livestock it is the NFO's marketing arrangement to sell your livestock through. Uh, we'll uh, uh, go into a little more detail on this in a little bit. Then uh, second would be the, uh, on dairy products would be the NFO's milk lockup program. And then uh, on grain would be the NFO's grain bank, which uh, uh, John has gone into a little bit of detail on and we'll go into a little bit more in a little bit here. Now, backing up to the livestock marketing arrangements, uh, Willis, would you like to go into some of the details of this and what's involved? Yes, Ed. We decided that to implement our, the bargaining power for our members, somehow we had to devise a structure that would disrupt the normal marketing of animals uh, through the normal channels. This, in turn, would create competition among the buyers 
Because at this point, they wouldn't be uh, as sure of their normal supply channels as they had been in the past. So we set up our NFO meat marketing arrangements, we call them. They have been developing over the past two to two and a half years to the point where now we have 180 delivery points. Now these are either collection points or they're direct plant delivery. Uh, we're expanding these constantly. Uh, just this past week, I worked in 11 counties in Northeast Iowa to establish four new collection points where our members can sell their livestock on given days. It has gotten to be a large operation uh, to handle and oversee 180 delivery points all over the Midwest. Uh, we're moving, moving huge amounts of livestock, and we certainly feel sure, Ed, that this has, has enhanced our price level to a great degree. Now, as, uh, as an individual farmer, uh, first of all, uh, you have to join the NFO before you can sell through the marketing arrangements, right? Very definitely. Uh, why is this? This is a legal point. Uh, it just is not allowable for the NFO as a service organization to bargain for the products of non-members. Uh, this is written in the law. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, as far as this uh, member then is uh, concerned, how does, uh, how does he go about selling his, uh, who does he contact and this sort of thing? First, we set up a collection point, uh, roughly a 20 mile radius. This is the area we, uh, we plan to cover with our point. This is the area that our invi members are invited to sell uh, their livestock through a given point in about a 20 mile radius. We have our local elected county meat bargaining committees that handle the program. So any of our members that prefer to sell through these points simply call the county chairman of his county or the chairman of the county meat bargaining committee. It's all taken care of. Now, uh, what are some of the benefits then, uh, Willis, of selling through the marketing arrangements? And you have a chart here that uh, maybe would, uh, if we could have the camera focus on it, it would explain this a little bit better. Would you want to explain that then? Uh, Willis, uh, this chart. Yes, I'd be glad to. Uh, certainly all farmers have benefited from the NFO marketing arrangement. Now, if you will note this chart, the supply line on the bottom indicates the supply of hogs from January 1961 through July, of, or about the middle of July, 1967. And if you will notice, this supply line is relatively stable. Of course, we have our seasonal dips and our seasonal rises in supply. But overall, it's quite a stable picture on the supply line. The top line indicates the price line received for hogs. Now, these are not figures uh, that were put together at the NFO office in Corning. These are USDA figures. It covers the same period of time, January 1961 to July 1967. And you will note that the top or the price line follows to a great degree the supply line on the bottom until we reach a point in the middle of February of 1965 for the arrow point. This is when NFO marketing arrangements came into being on a small scale. You will note the price line goes up sharply, very sharply, and it stays much higher at, from that point on to the end of the chart, then the supply line should indicate if supply and demand were actually the total influence on the price. Now, we have delved real deep into this. We have found no other factor involved in the price of these hogs than the NFO marketing arrangement that created this sharp rise in prices. Well, certainly the supply, uh, according to the bottom line, stayed relatively stable, and, uh, and the price did change in the NFO uh, Marking range was the only difference. Is, uh, yes, and right. the chart would indicate that it changed from four to five dollars a hundred weight. And this certainly should be ample proof to uh, any and all farmers that the NFO marketing arrangements on livestock stock can have an effect on the prices. And uh, for this reason, uh, it's a tried and proven program. We certainly encourage all of the farmers to uh, uh, market, uh, join the NFO and market their livestock uh, through the NFO marketing arrangement. Now, uh, with 180 collection points in. Well, it's, uh, certainly no one would have to go out of their way very much to deliver hogs uh, or livestock in through these points, uh, right? This is right. Uh, the, the total structure is designed so that our members, uh, none of them should have to travel more than 20 or 25 miles. 
Now we draw a circle around a point about a 20 mile radius, and of course this would be as the crow flies, but by road it might even extend up to 30 miles. But certainly it still is a convenient market. I know in my area that we have two points that we can go to, one at uh, West Branch, Iowa, and, and one at Belle Plaine, Iowa, and both of these are within nice driving distance with a trucker to pick up either one. And uh, now going on to the uh, uh, NFO's uh, milk program, Willis, would you elaborate on this somewhat? Now, I know that the milk program isn't quite as well developed as our meat program, but we're working on it, and would you explain the details on this? Uh, we call it the lockup in our dairy program. It was developed shortly after the uh, major holding action uh, was over last spring. It amounts to the farmer selling his milk to a designated NFO plant, the plant manufacturing this raw milk into one of the various products, cheese, butter, or powder, and then selling this product, the finished product, to the Commodity Credit Corporation, where uh, it is stored. And I've, I think I'm right on this. It cannot be released to the market again at less than 110% of the, of the cost when it was put in. This isolates this much milk product from the market. And certainly, uh, as the program builds and the supply going into the program uh, becomes greater, that it can be an influence and will be an influence on the price of milk. Now, as far as an individual farmer that uh, would be milking, how would he go about uh, arranging for this, Willis? Well, of course, first, uh, this again is confined to NFO members. It is an F NFO design program. But then, of course, you must sell through a plant uh, that has made these arrangements with the National Farmers Organization and has the equipment to meet the quality specifications, the packaging specifications of the Commodity Credit Corporation. And uh, then uh, if you would get more and more participation in this program, what would be the general uh, overall effect? Well, it certainly should affect the price of, of dairy products. This, in turn, will affect the price of raw milk, because this amount is isolated from the market. Then uh, going uh, back to the holding action uh, that the NFO had some time ago on milk, what was some of the results or effect of this then, Willis? We do know, of course, uh, there was a planned decrease in the price of milk in the federal order areas. It would, am would have amounted to about 40 cents a hundred weight. This was prevented. Uh, federal order hearings were called in rapid fire very fast after the conclusion of the holding action. And, uh, and uh, the great discontent of the dairy farmers, the se severe financial bind the dairy farmers are in, Federal order hearings were called real fast after the holding action. The 40 cent price drop uh, that was in the planning was eliminated. Through the federal order hearings, uh, there was about a 20 cent a hundred increase in the price of class one milk. Uh, this were the immediate effects of the holding action. And of course, the lockup dairy program are, is more of a long range uh, effect. I think, uh, Willis, when you look at the, uh, not only the uh, uh, dairy program, but also the market arrangements on livestock, that uh, a lot of people say, well, you cannot hold, or this is a problem, and so on. But I think, uh, probably, in looking at the thing realistically, farmers are going to have to be like good businessmen, and uh, every good businessman holds every day that he has anything to sell. And uh, what the market arrangements do in the lockup program in dairy and so on is it puts you in a position where uh, you're, you're actually selling your products, but you're still strengthening your bargaining power because as you sell them together as a group, then uh, the processors must deal with you as a group. And certainly, if you have a volume of uh, several thousand head of hogs a day, uh, you'd have a lot more bargaining power than I'd have with a couple, three truckloads a day, uh, as the case might be. And uh, this is true all the way through the NFO program, of course. Now, going on to the NFO grain bank, which is a relatively new program for the NFO. And uh, I, at this time, we don't have quite all the details on it, but I'm sure by the time this program is shown in your area, that probably the details will be out and you can get them from the uh, NFO uh, grain committee in your county and uh, the other officers and members and so on, probably. Uh, now, uh, going to John Ingalls, uh, would you 
explain what some of the proposals are in terms of this and what's involved, John. Well, Ed, uh, I would like to just briefly here go into the background of our grain programs and probably elaborate somewhat on the reasons why this has taken such a, uh, or rather has received such wonderful acceptance among our members and among farmers in general. I think if we'll all think back to about one year ago, we had all kinds of statistics, government uh, reports and uh, private reports, and everyone was stating a, a something to the effect that we were now approaching the threshold of a golden era in agriculture. The farmer in the past year has witnessed a great decrease in the price of grain due to the fact primarily that he has agreed to increase production along with the uh, thinking and the lines and guidelines set out by the United States Department of Agriculture. I think that farmers have a great sense of patriotic duty, uh, both uh, for their own country and also for human welfare throughout the world. And when they were encouraged to increase their production, they of course did this and uh, were quite uh, well satisfied to help out. But this is boomerang, so to speak, to to the degree that this actual small amount of increase that they did plant has depressed their prices far beyond what we would term to be a reasonable drop. As a result of this, there's been great concern in the Midwest about grain prices in general, particularly in wheat, and of course uh, somewhat in soybeans and, and principally also in corn. Now, the grain bank program was derived from the fact that we had learned in our in-position grain sales through the past year that, and of course, these are just proof uh, that we have picked up of some of the things we always did uh, surmise, or at least uh, had a good uh, indication was true, and that is that anyone who controls a large quantity of grain in this nation can practically, by the by the direction that this grain moves, control to a great degree the price of this grain. Now in the past, we have seen two dominating factors, and of course there are several factors in the grain market, but we've seen two dominating factors in the market. One was the reserve that the federal government had, and, one, and the other, of course, was the amount of grain that the large grain companies were handling. This affected the price and influenced the price to a great degree. And from this we learned or at least it was confirmed that if farmers ever wanted to price grain, that they had to have a large quantity of grain that would move in a one direction as farmers wished it to move. And then, of course, we could become effective in price. And this is the seed or the germ that uh, brought about the, uh, the in-position grain sales and the grain bank program. Now, we are, of course, uh, as I stated earlier, we are going to ask all farmers and uh, specifically NFO members to sign up at least 50% of their grain, saleable grain, in the uh, grain bank. And, of course, that that cannot move into the normal market channels at a dollar and a half, we will use the facilities and the uh, leads that we have developed in the past year to export this. And I might add very firmly here that NFO has the leads has the contacts and has the ability to export grain. And they've also had a considerable amount of experience uh, in exporting grain up to this point, right, John? This is true. We have uh, worked very closely with some of the uh, grain people uh, in the grain trade and also our own man, uh, Sam Hoffmeyer in Kansas City. Now, uh, Willis, as far as uh, the grain program is concerned, what's the, what uh, would this have on the overall picture of agriculture if you worked on grain and did something in terms of a better price for grain? Well, of course, we've, we've always known all our lives, those of us who farm, that grain prices do influence the price of all other products because, after all, it is a basic commodity. It's a commodity. It's fundamental. So as we look back over the 52-year period of the livestock industry, we find this. And if people are wondering what they might expect next year for hog prices or cattle prices, this might give you some guidelines. If you want to use 52-year uh, averages, that about 13 times the price of a bushel of corn will be the price of hogs. 
about 18 times the price of one bushel of corn will be the price of fed cattle. So if anyone is curious about it, if you believe in 52-year averages, this might indicate to the farmers what to expect in the livestock industry uh, with grain selling at what it is right now. Well, certainly that uh, indicates that something should be done about the uh, grain prices then. Now, uh, uh, when this, John, going back to John again, John Ingalls, if this, this grain is put into the grain bank, uh, how would, uh, as you understand it now, how would this be handled? Uh, what would the farmer need to do? Well, of course, the farmer, first of all, would have to be an NFO member to participate in this. And then, of course, he will sign this grain on a grain sales agreement in which the grain will actually be tied up under an NFO sale. Uh, the purpose of all of our programs, and I'd like to point this out very, very emphatically, the purpose of all programs in NFO is to establish the contracts at the marketplace which will stabilize prices in the future. It doesn't do us any good just to hold for a little while and temporarily take the price rises that may occur. The thing that farmers need to do is establish their power, their bargaining power, by selling together. And then, of course, in the ultimate end, arriving at contracts which will stabilize the marketing conditions and prices of their products. Uh, well, let's uh, real briefly explain, could you explain what these contracts would involve in a general way that uh, John mentioned? Of course, all contracts are subject to the approval of both parties involved, the seller and the buyer. An NFO contract would be no different. It would involve moving a certain amount of production, a given amount of a given quality, to a given market, and at this point, the farmers would be the controlling factor in the price. They would put their own price on the product. This well, is about as simply as you can state it, Ed. Well, if our time is uh, drawing to a close, and do uh, you have a few closing comments to make? I've noticed uh, since our meeting for action in Des Moines, an increased acceptance of the NFO program. I've seen a tremendously increased flow of new membership coming into the, into the NFO in my Levin County area where I spend most of my time. I couldn't help but notice a remark made by the President of the United States at his news conference shortly after our meeting. And it, I quote, farmers, he said, are on the short end of the stick, unquote. This marked the first time in the history of our country at this news conference that the president came out in favor of collective bargaining for farmers. So to me, the increased acceptance of the NFO program uh, just since the meeting for action is real heartening, Ed. Uh, certainly, the uh, NFO is the leader in collective bargaining in agriculture today. And I think quoting again from the uh, House Committee uh, uh, on Agriculture's report, uh, it says that the projected net income of agriculture for 1967 is 15 and 5 tenths billion, compared to 17 and 1 tenth billion in 1947. While the national income shows an increase of 223 percent, farm income is down 9 percent. And certainly, farmers need to reverse this trend of agriculture income going down while the rest goes up. And I would urge you that are not yet NFO members to uh, contact your neighbor who is an NFO member and ask him to join the NFO today. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week for more facts on agriculture and rural America, the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity. Tune in again next week at the same time for another edition of U.S. Farm Report, sponsored by members of the National Farmers Organization in this local area.